friends welcome to today's session session number 69 of young indian digital sunday webinars today uh, in our case series uh, case series number 8 is a discussion on a young male with renal calculus and multi organ failure and uh, to present this will be shubhajit sen he is a third year dnp student at apollo glen eagles calcutta the case is uh, from apollo calcutta glen eagles hospital and is moderated by chandrashi chakravarti sir is a senior consultant there uh, in apollo glen eagles calcutta we thank him and uh, shubhajit for making this presentation and uh, moderating the session will be ma'am ma'am is uh, there for you she is uh, professor sheela nayan mehra known to all of you and recognized nationally and internationally for her work a uh, brief profile uh, which does not do actually justice to the work is that she is president elect of the indian society of critical care medicine she is the chief of uh, intensive care medicine committee of the world federation of societies of anesthesiology she is the past president of the all india difficult airway association and uh, among the 14 international international uh, experts on asa puma guidelines that is project for universal management of the airway she has been appointed on the international surviving sepsis covid guidelines and research committees uh, and uh, she is uh, also developing who oxygen algorithms for different resource settings and she has developed a new test in hemodynamic monitoring for the tidal volume challenge with which i think all of you are familiar and uh, she is a member of the editorial board of several journals like anesthesia canadian journal of anesthesia journal of critical care and many others and she has over 100 indexed publications and over 40 book chapters so we thank ma'am for her time and uh, uh, this uh, webinar we will be discussing the current uh, surviving sepsis guidelines which have been published uh, just a few months ago there is this discussion will be focused on that and i and chandrashish shall discuss the case ma'am will give our expert comments and towards the end ma'am will make a short presentation on the current hemodynamic resuscitation guidelines by the surviving sepsis uh, campaign guidelines so with that we shall proceed over to you shubhajit uh, before that i just like to say thank you tapesh and uh, uh, it's indeed a great honor and pleasure to be here once again at your program and uh, i really commend you for doing this uh, very noble teaching activity and welcome to both the moderator and the uh, presenter of the case today i really look forward to an exciting discussion over to you thank you thank you ma'am Uh, so good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sujit Sen from Apollo Building Hospital, Kolkata. Now Apollo Multi-Specialty Hospital, Kolkata, and it is a really privilege for me uh, to present a case in this August forum. And I, uh, without any ado, I would like to start uh, my case. Let me share the screen. Okay. So today my case is a case of a young male with renal calculus and. Yeah, it's okay. Carry on. I've lost the audio. Sorry. Ah, uh, uh, ma'am, can I? Am I audible yeah. now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you're audible. Ah, uh, the presentation of our case uh, was a is a case of a 35 year old male who is from Kolkata, West Bengal, uh, who do not have any comorbidity in the past and not on any chronic medication. By profession, he is a stationary shop owner. He was transferred to our ER from an outside hospital on 14th of January of this year. A little bit going to the background of the case, he was admitted at an outside hospital with flank pain on 24th of December 2021, where he was diagnosed with nephrolithiasis with right-sided hydronephrosis. He underwent a nephrolithotomy there with DJ stenting on 27th of December 2021. it was well and good after post op period he was recovering and was also discharged from the hospital but he developed fever pain abdomen hematuria on 5th of the january 2022 he was again readmitted to the hospital for further evaluation when he was suspected to have a urinary tract infection or a urosepsis for which he was prescribed cefuroxim gentamicin can we move the slides shubhajit yeah, can you move the slides 
Slides are not moving. Your slides are not moving. Yeah. Ma'am, is it moving now? No. Uh, no. Uh, just give a minute. I will stop the share and share. Yeah, just reshare. Also, you know, so, don't start with. Um, it's always better to build up the case rather to tell us that it was multi-organ failure and it was, you know. Okay, okay now carry on. Okay. Uh, so he was admitted in an outside hospital with flank pain on 24th of December 2021, where he was diagnosed with nephrolithiasis with right-sided hydronephrosis. He underwent nephrolithotomy and digestenting on 27th of December uh, to, uh, 2021. He was recovering, was discharged, but again he has to be readmitted on 5th of January 2022 for fever, pain abdomen and hematuria. So they suspected a urosepsis, so he, pre he was prescribed cefuroxim, gentamicin, then started on meropenem on the outside hospital. But in the outside hospital, this is uh, the, uh, the story I have got from the ER sheet, uh, which they have given a discharge summary from the outside hospital. So he developed a drop in urine output there, where his creatinine shot up to 12.1 milligram per DL on, on 6th of the January from 0.9, which was on the 26th of December. He also developed anemia for which he received one unit of pre-RBC. His creatinine continues to rise. He developed jaundice, progressive shortness of breath then developed hypotension for which he was on noradrenaline. With this background, he was referred to our hospital and before sending to our hospital, they have done a COVID RT-PCR also, which was negative. Now the patient landed in our hospital in the emergency One, department. Was he, having, was he having urine output? Sir, uh, he had drop in urine output. He was not aneuric, but there was oliguria uh, in the outside hospital when he was transferred to our hospital. So what, was any fluids given at all? It's written hypotension and... Uh, Ma'am, it was not mentioned okay. in the discharge summary. They have only written about the antibiotics they have given. Okay. And uh, the, the, the clinical condition of the patient. They have not mentioned what fluid or how much okay. fluid they have given in that hospital actually. Um. Go ahead. So we received the patient at the ear. Actually, the emergency team received the patient in the ear. At the ear, patient was conscious communicating. He was complaining of right flank pain even then. He was running a temperature of 99.1 degree Fahrenheit. His blood pressure was 140 by 60 on 5 ml per hour of norad. That is roughly 0.1 microgram per kg per hour of noradrenaline according to our hospital preparation. His pulse rate was 110 and minute. He was running a respiratory rate of 40 per minute. He was put on NIV in the ER with an IPAP of 14 and EPAP of 8 with 8 liter per minute oxygen. He was maintaining a SATS of 94%. In ER, they took a measurement of his height and weight. It was 174 centimeter and 65 kgs. Now further, they have investigated the patient and examined the patient clinically. There was pallor and icterus on general survey with pedal edema. On chest auscultation, there was bilateral basal crepitations were there. And ARNT was somewhat decreased in the basis also. The abdomen was tender on palpation, especially patient was complaining of a uh, pain on the right side of the flank. Uh, arterial blood gas was done uh, in the ER, which showed a pH of 7.41 with a PCO2 of 31 and a PO2 of 57.9. He was on 8 liter per minute of oxygen through an IV. So, His bicarbonate so, was 19.5. Yes, sir. Shubhajit, uh, uh, point to be noted there are that he's got bilateral uh, reps, he's got pedal edema, right? And uh, yes, sir. he seems to be having excessive fluid. Huh? Yeah, most likely his volume overloaded at that point. Yeah, time. that could be one thing because pedal edema has appeared, which seems to suggest that he has volume overload. Chest, yes, little crepes could be ARDS, could be fluid overload that we have to see. Then yes. What is your interpretation, Shubhaji? So at this time, my interpretation is uh, the patient is in, in volume overload, which may be secondary to sepsis. And there is a distributive type of shock is going on in this patient. He is requiring noradrenaline. He is requiring oxygen. Uh, so there is a distributive shock going on. And uh, also there is volume overload in this patient. So, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Kapesh. Yeah, the ABG actually is showing a pH of 7.41. A PO2 is uh, hypoxemic is 58. And this I presume is on NIV with oxygen support. Yes, sir, 8 liter per minute oxygen. HCO3 is 20. So this is yes. uh, like uh, chronic respiratory alkalosis with compensation. You know, the compensation yes, 
is a drop of four of bicarb for every drop of uh, ten of uh, PCU. PCU. That is what you would expect because he has been uh, hyperventilating for some time. You know, he is having this hypoxemia. So this is what it is. Of course, the drop in bicarb is also due to the renal dysfunction, but that is the interpretation of the ABG. But a point to be noted is the bicarb is not very low, considering the fact that he is uh, uh, in sepsis and he has advanced renal dysfunction. And uh, the other thing noted so far is that he received bendamycin. In a patient who is having uh, elevated creatinine, he has been given gentamicin. So gentamicin, I mean, it's a very good drugs for uh, urinary tract infection because they achieve a very high concentration in the urinary tract. But and you can give it if there is renal dysfunction with the uh, you know nanograms or with the uh, serum levels. But one has to be aware of the toxicity and uh, the toxicity of gentamicin as far as renal toxicity is concerned comes after around five days and it is reversible and it leads to non oligovirate renal failure. Mm-hmm. And to be noted is that he has received gentamicin which may have contributed to his renal dysfunction. Absolutely. I'd just like to add a few points. So before we go into labs and uh, we go into the treatment, uh, let's just go back to examination. So it's always your examination, then your investigations, and then what you're going to do, treatment, right? So let's just go, go a slide back and tell me by just from the history that you're getting, are yes, you ma'am. calling this sepsis or is this septic shock? Ma'am, if you go, uh, if I go through the QSOFA score uh, in the ER, the patient is having a respiratory rate of 40 with a blood pressure of 140 by 60 that requiring noradrenaline stafford. Two out of uh, three QSOFA indicators are positive here. Although the new guidelines have said not to rely on QSOFA alone, but here in this clinical scenario, given the history of a uh, uh, urinary tract manipulation and a digestion thing, I will still like to diagnose this case as a case of sepsis. Yeah. So if you go by his history, okay, with those multiple procedures, the fever, all these conditions, it's likely sepsis, definitely, right? Yes, and he is in shock because he's requiring noradrenaline to maintain his blood pressure. Of blood course, pressure. shock is not, um, uh, hypotension is not mandatory to make a diagnosis of shock. You should have an elevated lactate. But the lactate that you have is an ABG done following resuscitation. So he's not come to you. He's gone first to another hospital. And it's quite suggestive that he, as the patient said, he may be fluid overloaded. He might have been given a lot of fluid. That history is not Not there, right? So perhaps the lactate was much higher earlier and he's been given a lot of fluid despite that the blood pressure was not maintained. And that is why he is, uh, lactates may, may, you know, have cleared uh, in that much time. Now, my question to you in examination, when you have a patient in shock, First is your clinical assessment. Okay. Yes, so what would you look for? I mean, you're just telling me NORAD and BP and what, what is the thing that we're missing here? A patient comes uh-huh. to a shop. I want to start clinically. I'm telling you more from an exam point of view as well. Right. Okay. Yes, so I would be very okay. interested in the clinical assessment of a patient in shock. So how does the clinical assessment start? This the patient clinical assessment. Shock, right. And it's likely to be septic shock because uh, of the history and the background. Right. Tapish, is it okay? Ma'am, uh, yeah, yeah, please, ma'am, please. Okay, ma'am, our clinical assessment will start from looking at the patient and touching at uh, touching the patient. Right. So by look, we will see whether the patient is uh, looking dehydrated or not. He is he's having shrunken eyes, uh, a dry tongue. Although it has a fifty percent sensitivity of predicting hypovolemia. Mm-hmm. Also, touching the patient, I will like to phenotype the patient whether the patient's extremities are warm or cold. I would like to see the uh, flanks of the patient. I would like to see the thighs of the patient, whether any mottling present or not. Mm-hmm. Of course, I would like to assess the higher function, whether the patient is contra- conscious or confused. And uh, to some extent, I would like to check the blood pressure and the urine output also, because these three window will give me right. idea about so whether the patient must is going in an to... exam talk about the assessment of the cl- three clinical windows in shock. Okay. Yes. So the CNS... Start with the skin. Start with the you know palp. Uh, say, you know uh, the temperature. Okay. Palpating yes. the patient, looking for now when you are uh, doing that, looking for mottling and all the things that you mentioned. But there is a specific way to assess the perfusion at the bedside that has now gained. Yes, more... I will see the capillary refill time also. Correct, correct. Correct. So tell me, how will you check the capillary refill time? Though of course, so, capillary refill time usually we follow the protocol that has been set by the Andromeda shock trial. 
And that is one of the way of doing it. It's not validated, but there are other ways. But tell me some way by which you can check. So what would you do? I will. I will use a glass slide. Uh, using the pulp of the fingers, I will press it for the ten for ten seconds, and then I will remove the slide. I will see how how quickly or how uh, lately the uh, skin feels again. Uh, I will blanch the skin, and I will see the when blanching goes. I will uh, measure the time uh, in which the blanching goes away, and will record it as capillary refill time. No, so what is the what is your endpoint? Uh, I, so I the time know. means if I tell you it's ten seconds, what is your interpretation? No, usually uh, capillary refill time a less than three uh, uh, indicates there is normal. Uh, see what, I, what I'm telling you, Doctor Sen, you're not saying anything wrong. It's just the way you are presenting it to me, right? So if I ask you capillary refill time, you must tell me that based on this Andromeda trial, there are various ways to do it. This is one of the ways to do it. It's not that this is the only way, but you have to tell me the endpoints. You have to tell me what you're looking for. You have to tell me the cutoff time. Then I have, can say that the capillary refill time is normal or not, right? I'm just saying organize your answer for an exam always, yeah. And uh, okay, so what what is mottling? No, skin mottling is a is the appearance of the skin. It is usually uh, seen around the knee. There is discoloration of skin and. Uh, a, a parchment like appearance of the skin that occurs in patients with who have uh, a tissue hypoperfusion it is measured around the knee actually and the different areas uh, around the knee usually gives us the gradation of shock in do the patient you know, do you know some grading for mottling uh, at present i can't remember ma'am the exact name Okay, but you should know all this. Okay, when you are talking yes, about I, I know, skin, I know. <laughs> you have to look for altered mental status, and you have to look yes. for urine output. So you should talk about clinical assessment first. Okay, and proceed in this order. Not that this is the antibiotic. Um, I'm just saying in a sequential assessment of shock. Right now, this yes. patient has already been treated. He's not come to you like say from a ward, and you know, so things have already been done. So this is quite a complicated case. Not a simple case. Okay, he's already on vasopressors, probably given given a lot of fluid, and he's not maintaining his Uh, blood pressure. So this guy, he is in septic shock. So the next thing I would look at is a blood gas, and like the patient rightly said, his um, uh, lactate. So the lactate yes. in this case is not uh, elevated. I don't have the ABG here in front of me, but I think it yes, was. This, not. this is the ABG, ma'am. Yeah. And your first part with resuscitation would be your ABCs. So let's look at his airway. What was the thing? He was very tachypneic, no? I think respiratory. Yes, it was tachypneic, ma'am. Uh, forty. Yes. No? What was the respiratory? Ah, uh, respiratory rate was forty per minute. Right. Yeah, and how much saturation? Because a lot of information is not here. What saturation was he maintaining here? Ninety-four on this or before? Ninety-four on uh, eight liter of oxygen uh, in in the so ER. Was he, was he comfortable liter. after? Um... No, ma'am. He was tachypneic and uh, he was complaining. Actually, the flank pain was more uh, compared to his tachypneic uh, dyspnea. He was more complaining of a flank pain that time rather than complaining of dyspnea. Okay, so tell me in your initial resuscitation. You'll focus. What will you do for him? He's come to you with pain. He's come in respiratory distress. He's come in hypotension. How will you decide whether this patient needs to be intubated or not to be intubated? It will be. Uh, it, it is there. Forty. Yes. Uh, so, ma'am, there may not be any uh, one single parameter that should be that should we use in this patient. We should have a holistic approach. uh for decision of intubating this patient or not he is a young guy uh, a 35 year old male without age, any comorbidities age is not a, age and covid comorbidities are not criteria for treating intubation right it's an acute acute uh, management right so right. you can't say that he's young so i want to intubate him but he's old i will or he has comorbidities so i will i'm saying these are considerations but they are not the first things you talk for criteria for intubation right as a clinician when i see a patient who comes in acute respiratory failure i need to know mm -hmm. is this patient for non invasive support should i intubate him immediately or should i use uh, you know do it after some time right is it isn't that right yes. so i am asking yes. you as a clinician as an intensivist when a patient comes to you in acute resp in respiratory failure like this is respiratory failure right how yes. would you how would you make that decision would you straight away intubate this guy or what is your criteria 1 2 3 4 5 for intubation it cannot be age and comorbidities tell me the most important ones first Ma'am, one is the PF ratio of this patient. Uh, the so oxygenation, PF whether the PF ratio comes when you do a ABG, right? So first you have to tell yes. me. Ma'am, clinically, are if the patient is. Are there reasons to intubate him? Are there reasons not to intubate him? Right. So are there reasons? Ma'am, the, the decision. Ha, decision of intubating will depend upon his work of breathing first. 
whether the patient is uh, the work of breathing of the patient is high or not and whether there is a chance of impending respiratory failure whether the patient is lethargic the patient is uh, patient is um, maybe about to crash also uh, situations we have faced that patient is so much tired and lethargic that he may crash any time in that case we will go for, uh, we may prefer mechanical ventilation first compared to niv and the patient uh, if the patient is uh, very much hypotensive uh, requiring high dose of pressures at that time uh, we may like to intubate the patient and take the diaphragm out of equation because it consumes a lot of lots of cardiac output for a I patient who is already in important criteria that is not in this case but an important criteria if he has altered mental status okay Yes. I mean, if he is uh, offended, okay, but in this case, I think he is less than eight. He is in profound good. shock. He is maintaining on a low dose of vasopressors, so it's acceptable. He is tachypneic, mm -hmm. but you can still try other non-invasive modalities, mm -hmm. and of course, your blood gas. Okay, so you, but even in his blood gas, I think uh, Tapish PO2 is low, na? No? On uh, after PO2 is fifty-nine. Fifty-seven point nine. So you, I, um, the PF ratio is around one thirty-five. I have calculated okay. that right. So this is after you're giving an IV. I'm just trying to say one thing that you should be able to justify why you're not intubating this patient and why you want to initially try non-invasive respiratory support. So we have very good bridges to therapy. Okay, over conventional oxygen therapy, we have two other modalities. You talked about mm -hmm. NIV. Do you know about anything else? HFNO is there, ma'am. High frequency, so high, high flow nasal oxygen. So you could use both of these, and both of these give you PEEP. Okay, so yes. they are superior to conventional oxygen therapy. If you keep your mouth closed, then HFNO can also give you some amount of PEEP. It can reduce your wake work of breathing. It can actually avoid, completely avoid a tracheal intubation. But you have to see the response. You have to assess whether the patient is improving or not, even um, NIV, right? And NIV has a less of a role in patients who have a PDF ratio less than 150. You can actually be doing harm. Okay. Do you know any yes. study from which that yes. will come? There is lung safe, one study known as lung safe study, which has uh, given us this one for your one less than one by 150 PF ratio. Right. Which so actually just, causes harm to the patient. Just because I'm starting with airway, I'm telling you all this. So you have NIV and you have HFNO. So if a patient comes to you with a very poor P2F ratio like this, or in COVID, I would say if they're having very high tidy volumes on NIV, these are the patients you might consider to intubate early or switch over to HFNO. And with HFNO, you can continue with these patients. And do you know if any other study which has compared head-on HFNO with NIV? Ma'am, Heliwatt trial is there which used uh, the helmet no, NIV with no, HFNO. No, no. I'm saying there's only one French multicentric trial. Oh, the Florally study, ma'am. The Florally yes. study, I think. You must talk about the Florally one study. So anyone Florally comes study. to an acute, this is like acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. No? It's not uh, mm. hypercarbic, right? It's a, uh, yes. So yes. in this patient, so can you just broadly tell me what is shown in a patient with NIV and HFNO? The evidence. This much you should uh, know as an intensive, it's not major trials, but this you must know. Florally one result. Florally one result, they have shown that they, uh, that we can try HFNO. It is non-inferior to NIV in patients who are presenting hypoxemic res uh, respiratory failure. Yeah. So there was no difference between NIV and HFNO, but in 90-day mortality, HFNO was superior. And in the subgroup of patients who had a P2F ratio less than 200, HFNO was better. I'm just trying to say that you must have reasons to give one non-invasive modality over another. Okay, and also keep in mind that this patient might, as you're resuscitating, he might deteriorate, he might not get better. So you need to repeatedly assess this patient. And he is still continues to be in shock because he's on vasopressors. And other important findings which you talked about are pedal edema and the crevice. With bilateral uh, uh, So why do you think, what would be your differential diagnosis for this? I mean, is it because... Uh, bilateral pedal edema uh, and basal crepes first is due to volume overload. Patient may have gotten lots of fluid in the outside hospital and he is having a compromised renal function that may have led to this condition. Second is patient may having a LV dysfunction also at the time, which may be sepsis induced LV dysfunction also. That may lead to pedal edema and bilateral uh, basal crepes. That is the reason I'm asking you this, is there's one important assessment that we have missed over here, right? While we're managing this patient. And what is that? Uh, the, uh, the hemodynamic status and the fluid responsiveness status of this patient, ma'am. Uh, yeah, hemodynamics, yes. But what, what have we not done for this patient? 
actually there should uh, man, apart from clinical investigation we should go for a point of care ultrasound in this patients also absolutely an echocardiography right is very important especially if this patient they might not have given so much fluid but this patient is having creps already right so yeah. remember that is if it's septic shock you're talking about distributive it may not always be distributive okay it, sometimes you have mixed shock so it could be yes. septic shock along with cardiogenic shock okay because sepsis yes. there could be sepsis induced myocardial dysfunction which could you know ejection fraction you know if and this guy has been in multiple whatever settings he's been got well and he's got really sick can you know so he could have uh, a very serious infection though it's not manifesting like that clinically so this is why the screening echo is paramount in this uh, condition before initiating any further uh, support to this patient and especially yes. considering he has Uh, Krebs and pediatricima. So, do we have yes, that? Did you do that? Actually, we have done it when we if patient came to ICU. I will show it in the uh, next slide, ma'am. This is okay. what they have done in the ER. They have drawn the blood and urine culture. Started the patient on a broad, very broad spectrum antibiotic, IV cholestin and phosphomycin. Uh, inserted the lines and sent the patient to ICU. After that, we have received the patient actually, ma'am. Before okay. that, it was from the emergency department. Mm -hmm. The data I have collected is from the emergency department. So that is fine. Just, the reason uh, I'm just telling you is that you should know initial resuscitation of a patient in sepsis. That's why I'm telling yes, you. Yes. No, you will see him only in yes. ICU. Yeah. So now the patient is received in ICU. He was conscious, communicating with a uh, right flank tenderness. He was still febrile with a temperature of 100 degree Fahrenheit, with a pallor, ictus, and pedal edema. That's like they have found in the emergency. Uh, he was on a noradrenaline of 0.2 microgram per kg per minute. The requirement has increased. But his respiratory rate came down to 26 per minute with NIV. His oxygen requirement was still uh, 8 liter per minute. Uh, during this transition period, he had produced around 20 ml of uh, urine per hour. This is our examination in uh, um, in in our ICU. He was tachypneic. Respiratory rate I have mentioned 26 per minute. He was a bit anxious. His chest uh, again had bilateral crepitation on auscultation. We done a capillary refill time, which was three second dot here. his tongue swelled dry but abdomen was tender on palpation this is the abg and this is the bedside focus that we have uh, performed uh, in the patient in the icu his abg he has a ph of 7.43 his po2 has increased to 147 pco2 is now 31.6 his bicarbonate is 20.6 with a hemoglobin of 7.7 and lactate is still 1.31 we have done a bedside focus which received, uh, revealed no rwma ejection fraction was around 60% there was no chamber enlargement the ivc was measured maximum diameter of ivc was 1.4 cm with a respiratory variation on lung ultrasound we have found there is bilateral b lines and there is minimum pleural effusion so what is your assessment of this patient do you think he needs more fluid or do you think he's uh... you know not to response what do you think from this initial assessment ma'am clinically my impression is patient okay. is uh, volume overloaded because he is having pedal edema he is having bilateral creps on the same time his crt is 3 seconds also and on uh, this that one of the parameters we have checked in uh, in uh, usg is ivc which is 1.4 cm which is less but at the same time patient is having bilateral b lines uh, in the in his lung So, so the patient may be IVC variability I like to tell you so see uh, yeah. about IVC diameter so IVC diameter does not tell you about fluid responsiveness what does IVC no, diameter correlate with IVC diameter the actual diameter what does oh. it correlate with it correlates with uh, if the patient is on uh, ventilation then IVC distant distensibility if it is not on ventilation then collapsibility of the IVC Yeah, yeah, you're right. But I'm saying you are telling me the diameter, the actual diameter, right? So diameter correlates with what? Diameter it, it may go correlate with the uh, uh, RA pressure and the pressures in the RA also. Correlates with what? It, it correlates CBB, with yes. okay. So it gives CBB. you an idea of preload. It doesn't tell you anything about fluid responsiveness. Remember, second hmm. point to remember that in a spontaneously breathing patient, any IVC variability is not reliable. it's reliable yes. like with any of the other tests that depend on heart lung interaction because during spontaneous breathing especially if a patient is breathing like this at the rate of 40 and each breath will have different missing so it's not reliable so if you're talking about i mean diameter it correlates with cvp if you're talking about respiratory variations in ivc diameter with you know the variations with respiration then you are talking about 
uh, fluid responsiveness. Okay, and even in that, there are cutoff. Like you rightly said, in spontaneous breathing, you look at the collapsibility index. Collapsibility. In uh, um, what do you call it? In controlled mechanical ventilation, you look at the distensibility. Distensibility. So, would you know how to measure the distensibility index? Because you can't say plus 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 means what? Actually, uh, so variations uh, are there, be... but you have some yes, cutoffs, no? Because when you yes, talk like this, I, you're putting your foot in for me, you know. Rapesh, are you okay with me asking some questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sumati, it's okay, no? No, no, you just... Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, yeah, yeah. I tend to talk a lot. I think something. this will be good for everybody, huh? So, yes. Please button any time because I just tend to talk. No, 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 I'm accepting. Please carry on, ma'am. I'll stop on that. You're, you're doing well, Jubal. You're doing well. That when I see this, no, you should not say just respiratory variation. What does it mean, respiratory variation? There are variations. Yes, but those variations, like you said, told me a couple of people time. You have to tell me the time, right? The same way the variations, it, it, there's a cutoff, no? So if it, the yes, cutoff if it is more or less than the cutoff, you may be responsive or not responsive. Again, in spontaneous breathing, you cannot uh, comment on this, right? I would yes. go more by the B lines. Okay, yes. so if I'm getting B lines on lung ultrasound, you know, these all help you clinically compound your diagnosis. It's not one thing that you will look at, right? So this patient is spontaneously breathing. I'm not going to rely on the IVC variability. I was just telling you to make the difference between the diameter and the variability, okay? So uh, I would go more by the V lines and I would like be worried. And if you told me the cardiac contract is good, the ejection fraction is good, there's no RWMA, everything else seems to be okay, all right? It's not that the cardiac function is suboptimal. So I would be concerned about this patient, uh, you know, what fluid he's received and what uh, therapies he's received, right? Okay. Yes, yeah, go ahead. What, you didn't give him something else? You didn't, um, there's something you missed? See, first when during the exam do initial resuscitation and symptomatic treatment, right? So is there something yes. you Ma'am, this is the examination part. Yeah, are you talking about the treatment part, ma'am? Okay, okay, you're coming to that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, we are, I'm coming to the treatment part also, ma'am. Hmm. Okay. So, initial uh, management of this patient, we have uh, given him NIV through critical care ventilator with a pressure support of 8 cm of uh, uh, water and uh, PEEP of 6 cm of H2. He was, in having a, he was requiring a FiO2 of 50%, so we give a small fluid bolus of th 300 ml of uh, normal saline. We have continued uh, the patient on IV cholestin and phosphomycin. Already blood cultures were sent uh, in from the emergency blood and urine cultures. And we have proceeded for imaging study in this patient. Okay. So what was the rationale to give uh, cholestin and phosphomycin? Actually, ma'am, in this patient, uh, the patient was in an outside tell hospital. Tell me one thing. I'll ask you in a different way. What is the likely infection? In the, how do you decide on antibiotics in a patient? Based on different um, uh, from uh, in uh, in a patient when we decide an antibiotic, we usually try to find the likely source of the infection. Of course, okay. where the uh, infection lies. Right. Here we have thought about a urinary tract infection or a urosepsis. Yes, Second okay. one is uh, the uh, possible organism that may cause the infections. Whether there there is a risk factor for any MDR organism. Uh, or a community acquired organism in this patient, in which uh, in our patient have both the risk factor for a MDR organism and a community acquired he's organism. He's had multiple hospitalizations, he's been in yes, uh, multiple hospitalizations, and there is a manipulation of urinary tract also, and there's a device in situ, a digestant was also in situ. Right. And it and was mentioned as a digestant. Antibiotics previously. What other considerations? Uh, sorry, ma'am. But the site, no? you can decide your antibiotics oh. based on the site, where the, what type of infection it is. Uh, based on whether you think it's an MDR bug or not. What else will decide? And a very important factor to decide which type of antibiotic you give. Also, uh, whether the, uh, the local flora and the type of infections that usually we get, the local microbiological microbiolo pattern also uh, guides us to select our uh, antibiotics, whether the local community acquired, hospital acquired bugs are uh, MDR, uh, multidrug resistance or not. Uh, that also gives Dr. us Sen, idea about what you are saying is right, but it's not in the right order. You know, for me, I need the most important things first. What okay. What else is my criteria? You talked about whether it's an MDR bug or not. You talked about the site. Okay, so if this was a brain uh, abscess, I would consider different antibiotics. If it is urosepsis, I will think different antibiotics. So site, MDR bugs. But other than that, something else. What about the clinical condition? 
Absolutely. What is a clinical condition? A guy like that who is absolutely stable and a guy like this with uh, who is in shock and who is so tachypneic and all is completely different. How sick is the patient, right? And also, what is the clinical condition? I mean, what are the comorbidities? Is he an immunocompromised patient? Is he or the thing? Is he on chronic steroids? Is he having any like that? That kind of patient, the antibiotic I'll select will be very different. Then, of course, your local flora, and but that comes much lower down. Okay, yeah. So, can you comment on uh, what are the antibiotics you would consider from the site point of view? Yes, ma'am. Uh, from the site of point of view, like we are, if we are, uh, if we are uh, considering a pneumonia, uh, community no, acquired pneumonia. Let's stick to let's stick to this for urinary tract infection. Okay. Uh, if you are co considering a uh, urinary tract infection, we may uh, uh, in in this in this case or ma'am in general, I think. Yeah, in general, for urinary tract infection. What are your antibiotics? In, ge in general, uh, urinary tract infection, I would like to prefer uh, my first antibiotic choice will be a beta lactam plus beta lactam as inhibitor that you may concentrate in the uh, urine. Mm -hmm. uh, if the risk of uh, ESBL organism is high in our uh, in our setup, or it, it is a, if it is a hospital acquired urinary tract infection, then I will like to start with the carbapenem antibiotics, which are proven to be effective but in that condition. Is phosphomycin good in his condition? Which class of antibiotic phosphomycin comes? Uh, phosphomycin? Huh? Is it an uh, aminoglycoside? Is it a, no, no, it's not an aminoglycoside. See, you, you should know all this, huh? You should know. Yes, right? yeah. When you're talking antibiotics, you should know. So if I have a simple urinary tract, in, what are the common, uh, you know, antibiotics? If phosphomycin is very good in this patient, but why? Yeah. What are the two, three points? I'm not going to tell you the class, otherwise you'll never look it up, okay? But it's not an amino class. What are the mm -hmm. plus points of phosphomycin? Phosphomycin has ma'am, good concentration in the urinary tract. Uh, it can be given yes. both IV and oral preparation also. Hmm. But something from the point of view of the first criteria, second criteria that you said, which this patient has, MDR bugs, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. MDR organism because it has the instrumentation. Patient has the history of instrumentation. Gram also. positive or gram negative? What does it cover? Uh, mainly gram negative organism phosphomycin covers. Yeah, but also gram positive, and it's very good for your yeah. MDR, and which is likely to be in this patient, right? With the. In this patient, yes. What are the other antibiotics uh, which work well in urinary tract infections? Ma'am, carbapenems, uh, they work well in urinary tract infection. See, carbapenems work well in uh, most infections, right? When the patient's very sick. I'm just asking you specific to urinary tract infection. A specific, ma'am, nitrofurantoin is there, which is, which, is, which is a urinary antiseptic mainly. Septran. These are the things that you yes. would consider for simple urinary tract infection. Your simple question can tract. lead to anything. That's why I'm asking you. Right? Yes. Now, in this condition, this case, phosphomycin is good because you're likely dealing with an MDR bug, MDR. but considering he's also quite sick, I mean, why have you added colistin? Why not? Uh, yes, considering the patient is um, uh, in septic shock, uh, we are we have added colistin, uh, which has good urinary penetration also, and uh, and patient coming from other hospital with a high risk of MDR organism, usually the, our local flora uh, is usually sensitive to cholestin only, intermediately sensitive to cholestin only. That's why we have added cholestin. From a renal standpoint, how is cholestin? Uh, renal standpoint, uh, yes, cholestin has uh, nephrotoxicity, but it also has uh, renal penetration also. So we can give cholestin in renal ad adjusted do doses in where we need a polymyxin, and but it is a urinary tract infection. In other cases, we can use uh, polymyxin B, but in urinary tract infection, we cannot use polymyxin B, but it will not concentrate in urine. We have to use cholestin here. Tapish, you want to comment on the antibiotic choice? Yeah, yeah. ma'am. Uh, so IV cholestin actually is nephrotoxic and uh, this thing of, uh, uh, you know, advanced renal dysfunction will be worsening the renal dysfunction probably. So, if possible, hold uh, cholesterol right now. Phosphomycin is great and uh, it's uh, you know, a wonderful drug for gram negative bacteria, especially for E. coli. Uh, and uh, the dose, of course, has to be modified for renal dysfunction. And uh, phosphomycin has been advocated as a, a single drug uh, in urosepsis. So, I don't think we really use it as a single drug when the patient is so sick with multi organ failure. We we'll probably have to use another drug. 
So uh, whether cholesterol is the right choice here, I am not sure. Uh, whether meropenem could have been continued or something else, or <clears throat> that has to be seen. But uh, cholesterol definitely is the last uh, drug to be used if there is renal dysfunction, as it would worsen renal dysfunction. And uh, you use it only if there is no other drug available in the setting of renal dysfunction. And also, <clears throat> you know, the, though the, uh, the renal toxicity is reversible with IV cholesterol, still you should not use it if there is another option. And I, uh, yeah. I completely agree with you. At this point, um, I think I would have continued with the meropenem. Okay, while awaiting the sensitivity, because this guy is quite sick, you know, he's not like crashing in front of you, but he is sick. Okay, uh, he has. Um, have we done uh, x ray or anything on him? Other than just a lung? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, you know, and we don't know because, you know, the thing is, you're always never think of one type of infection, okay? If a patient mm -hmm. presents to you so sick, he may have even pulmonary infection because he's been mm -hmm. in and out of the hospital. He's had all these multiple procedures. He's been on other antibiotics. So never think the site is only the urinary infection, though that may be the initial uh, this thing. So I may need to cover him not only with um, antibiotics specific to the urinary tract infections, but also I would prefer, considering he's so sick, to keep him on a broad spectrum antibiotic like a carbapenem. And uh, probably reserve cholesterol, absolutely right, like the patient said, especially considering the renal dysfunction, I would, you know, uh, keep cholesterol for later. This is just my uh, my rationale for choosing uh, Meropen, because he's quite sick, you know, this kind of patient, you're lucky he got better, but he I can really decompensate uh, if uh, he does not respond. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, this was uh, his initial blood reports. So his it is uh, sent from the ICU itself. So hemoglobin was 8.2. His total count came out to be uh, 30,700. His platelets was 1.38. His creatinine jumped to 7.1 with a urea of 207. His sodium was 122, potassium of 4.3, a chloride of 83. Uh, his bicarbonate in the labs were 16. His total bilirubin was 15 with a direct bilirubinemia of direct bilirubin of 9.6. And a AST of liver enzymes were normal. This is his images. This is um, the scout film of the CT scan that we have done in this patient. And these are the cuts which shows multiple airspace opacities and areas of consolidations which uh, appears in both upper and lower lobe of bilateral lung. And there is a thumb, uh, some thin rim of pleural effusion also, which is not significant, but there is uh, some pleural reaction also. So, so what was the interpretation of uh, this X-ray and the CT? Was this fluid or was this AI? Uh, so the patient uh, actually, uh, if we, we go with the Berlin definition, then the event is not within seven days. It started from fifth, and patient presented uh, as uh, to us on fourteenth or fifteen like that. So it is more than seven days duration of uh, of this okay, event. One minute, one minute. When you are talking about ARDS, na, you have yes, to talk about the respiratory symptoms within seven days. Huh? Your infection and the urinary tract infection. See, any systemic, any sepsis can result in ARDS, right? That is one of the risk factors, right? So your risk factor is your urosepsis. But you that might have gone on for even a month. But now you are developing these respiratory symptoms. So he is very much within the seven-day period, okay? But now since you're saying Berlin definition, my dear, you have to tell me what is Berlin definition. When the Berlin definition says uh, for the definition of ARDS, there's the onset of the disease should be less than seven days. Right. And uh, and then second is we have to uh, get a PF ratio in this patient, which should be no, no, less no, than. PF ratio is much later, before that what comes. CT or you are exam going. In, in, in CT or X-ray, we'll have bilateral chest infiltrates that will be not uh, explained by uh, atelectasis, fluid overload or collapse. Hmm. Ruled out by? The, ruled out by? Uh -huh. Some objective criteria you have to use, no? Ruled out by ECO, right? Huh. Here in the definition, you had to have a pulmonary artery occlusion pressure less than 18 and all that, but now you have to have echocardiographic confirmation, right? Yes. Bilateral yeah. infant And Bilateral onset, within, onset within uh, seven days, seven days. right? So seven. he is well within that window. You cannot say the, the his complaints for sepsis started maybe one month back or whatever, but he is well within the window for an ARTS, okay? So what do you think? Is this fluid overload? His COVID is negative? Because his uh, COVID is negative, ma'am. He just uh, before coming here, he had done a COVID RT PCR, which was negative. We have done a CVNAT test also in the ER, which was also negative. Okay. So what would you would you say this is ARDS? It uh, may or may not be, ma'am. Uh, it can be. Uh, it has bilateral fluffy exudates, 
uh, in both uh, involving both upper and uh, lower lobe of the lungs uh, within seven days, and his PF ratio is quite low. Bilateral fluffy and infiltrates are not exudates. Infiltrates, no. Hmm. These are infiltrates, from yes, these yeah. alveolar infiltrates. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it is not uh, it, and his eco finding uh, also uh, do not reveal any did not reveal any cardiac dysfunction also. And there is no obvious pleural effusion, collapse, or atelectasis that can explain these uh, features. And he also is having a sepsis, so it can well be a case of ARDS here. Of course, this is ARDS, isn't it? ARDS definitely. This is ARDS, right? Yeah. And now, how will you classify it? Mild, moderate, or severe? Mild, moderate, severe. It will be based on the PF ratio, but they have mentioned, and for PF ratio calculation, okay. we have to a uh, CPAP of five centimeter of H2O. Hmm. Uh, that you have to calculate. It. That you have, yes, have, yeah. Yes, and and have FLO also gives you five to seven of PEEP. So you yes, are on more than five to seven on PEEP. It's not the patient doesn't have to be intubated. The PEEP should be more than no. five. So more here, the the PEEP. PEEP. so mild is what, moderate is what, severe is what. So uh, mild is uh, the PF ratio should be uh, between two hundred to three hundred. Moderate should be two hundred to hundred, and severe should be anything less than hundred. Correct, correct. So what do you think, Tapesh? I would call this ARDS. Yes, ma'am. Looks I'm like ARDS. Good overload. And if you are really worried with the nil urine output and the this thing, I would just give him a shot of a diuretic and check if he was tachypneic because of uh, fluid overload. As you, if you were thinking that, I would give him a diuretic to uh, you know see if he improves. He might just improve if it was fluid overload, right? Also, ma'am, uh, he has a significant hyponatremia, 122, suggesting that there's already a lot of fluid that he's holding. Lots of fluids are in. Go back to the labs, you know. Yeah. Just go back. Maybe a dilutional hyponatremia. Yeah, so that hyponatremia. means there's a lot of fluid already he's holding inside excessive fluid. 122 is the sodium. So he's yes, definitely, like you said, ma'am, we have to give him diuretics rather than fluids. Here. And also bilirubin, uh, there's a liver involved with bilirubin of 15 and conjugated 9.6. Uh, just Shubhaji, I want to tell you one of the reasons why the bilirubin has gone up so much is also because of renal dysfunction. You know, bilirubin is of two kinds, direct and indirect. So the indirect is to albumin and does not go through the glomeruli. But the direct one, uh, actually, which is the conjugated uh, bilirubin, it goes through the glomeruli. So when there is a dysfunction, bilirubin does not get excreted. That is another reason why the bilirubin is going so high. Another interesting point is that the OTPT is normal, bang normal. So I will not use the alkaline phosphatase. Normally in toxic hepatitis, alkaline phosphatase is the uh, foremost of normality, if you look at the LFT. So I don't think that bilirubin would have been elevated in isolation. Probably the alkaline phosphatase was also elevated here. This is toxic hepatitis, what is happening. Correct, correct. And it's all sepsis related. And if you had profound hypertension, then probably your enzymes would also have been elevated like you see in a shock liver. But that's not been the case. Right? If you see, he's, um, probably they resuscitated him with fluid overzealously at the right time. And that was not an uh, issue. So, uh, tell me one thing. Now here, you're not doing any advanced hemodynamic monitoring. You wouldn't do it. He's kind of stabilizing, right? So, yes. if I have to decide whether to give more fluid to this patient, I would be concerned, right? Because his yes. urine output is very low, his urea is very high, creatinine is very high. There are many reasons why I should give him fluid. On the other side, there are some risk factors, right? To not to give fluid. So how do I decide uh, in which patient to give fluid or not? So there are, th there are three criteria. How would I decide in this patient? Clearly, the because I don't have any, uh, any tests now to decide whether I can do, uh, you know, should do advanced hemodynamic monitoring for him, right? Though he is a candidate for it because he has risk factors, right? If it was a straightforward yes. case and he improved, it's okay. But here he looks fluid responsive, but at the same time, he has, um, you know, B lines, he has uh, other risk factors, right? But if you look at his urine output, you look at his, uh, he's still in shock. There are reasons to give him fluid and there are reasons not to give him fluid. So such a patient should receive advanced monitoring. But otherwise, what are your general criteria to decide? Uh, uh, generally, we usually uh, check for fluid responsiveness of the patient and whether the patient is fluid tolerant or not. Mm. Whether the patient is deficit and uh, well, if he give fluid, whether he can tolerate it or not. Mm. Depend upon this, we'll devise the test for that. Mm. In uh, a spontaneously breathing uh, patient, we don't have many options. Uh, we can go for a cardiac output monitor in this patient and we can go for a, a passive leg raise, uh, raising test. Um, but in this patient with so much flank pain, uh, PAR will be very difficult to perform and it may give erroneous results also. Right. So you can look at the pulse pressure variation also 
Okay, it does not. Uh, spontaneously require. breathing pre uh, breathing patient. Exactly. Uh, exactly, but in spontaneously breathing patient, this will not be reliable. So if okay. you have a low pulse pressure variation, okay, you cannot comment whether the patient is fluid responsive or not. But if you put in an arterial line, you can get pulse pressure variation. And if you have a very high pulse pressure variation, if you have high, the reason low is uh, you know pulse pressure variation is not reliable during spontaneous breathing. The reason for that is because the um the pressure that is generated during spontaneous breathing is not high enough because the vascular pressures are not high yes. enough to produce those changes right so actually mm -hmm. you should you will get false negative that means you will get okay. lower values when the patient is actually fluid responsive so okay. the uh, ppv should be say 16 you will actually get a value of 8 but when you put a patient on arterial line this is a very important thing that you can do at the bedside you look at the pulse pressure variation and you see it's 20 it's 25 it should be actually false negative and low this is an indication that this patient is fluid responsive and then of course the echo your ivc variability with respiration is not that reliable but it can give you some idea now the reason i am telling you you are looking at the variability and you are saying yes there is ivc variability this patient has a dry tongue clinically he looks fluid responsive but at the same time he has b lines he has this thing. so what criteria do you use whether to give further fluid or not or to continue these process okay so i will tell you so in any patient the first thing the patient should be in acute circulatory failure if you not in acute circulatory failure don't consider giving fluids to this patient okay so answer my first question is this patient in acute circulatory failure this patient is still requiring norad to maintain his blood pressure so, so you have no doubt that he is in acute circulatory failure yes low blood pressure he has all the criteria okay so you have all the question but the second question you have to answer is is the patient fluid responsive because already a lot of fluid is given so now yeah. you know you have to check whether he is fluid responsive So you have not yet intubated him. None of the other tests will be uh, reliable. Even if you do passive leg raising, you need cardiac output monitoring, right? And if you're not going to do that, yes, then you can use things like this, like IVC variability, pulse pressure variation. This can give you some idea. Now, on your IVC variability, you are seeing that he is fluid responsive, right? Yes, so let us presume he is fluid responsive. He's still tachycardic. There are a lot of signs that tell you that this patient is actually fluid responsive. Okay. So then, would you give fluid? Then the third question you have to ask is: Are there risks of giving fluid? Yes. Okay, so the fluid is tolerated or not? The patient can tolerate the fluid. Not tolerated. Is there a risk of giving fluid? Now this patient has very bad lungs. He has bilateral infiltrates. He has B lines on this thing. So I would be very cautious about giving fluid to this patient. Additional fluid. So even if a patient is fluid responsive, if the risk of giving fluid is high, you should not give fluid. Do you understand? Okay. Just fluid responsiveness is not an indication to give fluid. So your answer to question three also should be no. that you know whether he has risk so if the risks are yes you don't give fluid yes. you should consider actually giving him vasopressors instead of yes. giving him a fluid or small bolus like you have rightly done you can just you know sort of give a fluid challenge and test if the risk is not too high but i would be very concerned so if possible i would have done some advanced hemodynamic monitoring in this patient but if not done also it's fine you're lucky the patient got better but uh, i'm saying these are the patients which are little complicated because now they have pulmonary involvement they started with urosepsis but now it's uh, pulmonary involvement yeah. okay go ahead sorry so these are the lung images we have also run a ct abdomen and this is the ct abdomen picture it was a non contrast study uh, it it shows the right kidney is hugely enlarged uh, with we can see the calcula we want calculus in the dilated ureter also left kidney also had the calculus And you can see in the uh, in the lower cuts in the bladder also there is some calculus. Why don't you just so point it out with your pointer so the for yes. the other so people? This is the dilated uh, right kidney, ma'am. Hugely dilated kidney, yeah. Yeah. and the left kidney also appears to be dilated. These are the upper cut just below the liver. This hmm. is uh, a lower cut which is uh, showing that the cortical uh, this cortical. there is some cortical thinning also. And here there is a small calculus we can see. It is uh, it's likely to be the ureter where there is a small calculus also. and here in the left kidney there is a large calculus looking like a staghorn calculus also uh, in the left kidney and in lower cuts in bladder there i can see there are two calculi this is a small calculi this is also a small calculi um, and uh, present in the bladder also correct yes carry on Uh, so seeing this ct and uh, this is some additional report that uh, we also got and uh, the crp was high 27 is milligram per dl in our institute the uh, unit is milligram per dl and uh, the procal was 312.5 uh, the unit is nanogram per ml 
his inr was 1.56 a d dimer was also sent it was 1944 a fibonacci level was 655 urine re came showing a pus cell of more than 100 So, Shivajit, uh, so, what is the role of Procal? Yeah. Any role of Procal now for sepsis? Diagnosing uh, sepsis or as a tool for diagnosing sepsis? So, there is no uh, role now, huh? as per the, the, the recommendation is not to use Procal routinely for diagnosis of sepsis, sir. <coughs> yes, very so, good. See, Procal has a role to kind of you know when you are prognosticating a patient, you can see a rise or you can see a decline to stop the antibiotic. But in this case, the patient is specifically asking you. Because why is he asking you that? Is there any role in this case? Because um, it's not reliable when there's renal dysfunction. Okay, yes, so it will not at all be reliable. Okay, it will just give you some trend, but it will not be a reliable marker. Yeah. Okay. No what is that report below? Sorry, I can't read that. What is that? No, I uh, I have given the Procal report actually. The okay. snap of the Procal report. Okay. This uh, showing the value three one two point five one actually. Okay. It was very high. That's why I kept the pro, yeah, snapshot also. Mm. So uh, seeing the CT and the other reports, we consulted the urology team who have advised us for a urgent drainage of the perinephric collection and the percutaneous and a percutaneous nephrostomy. Patient was still requiring a NIV with 50% of FiO2. We have continued the antibiotic, but he is still requiring the noradrenaline with uh, and now producing a urine of about 20 to 30 ml per hour. Then on the next day morning, a new episode occurred. Uh, he was still febrile, had one episode of hemoptysis, and there is an increase in noradrenaline requirement. At that time, uh, he received a fluid bolus of 500 ml. And PRVC blood cross matching and PRVC reserve uh, reserving was done, but he didn't receive any blood that time. He received only fluid bolus. His hemoglobin was 7.8. His TLC came to be uh, 24,600 with a leftward shift. His urea was pretty much same, 197 and creatine of 6.9 with a bicarb of 21. We have uh, due to both lung and uh, kidney uh, involvement. What is, the, uh, what is leftward shift of what? Uh, leftward shift of the uh, WBCs, ma'am. There were more blast cell and band cells. Uh, not okay. not blast cell, band cell, band cell. Okay. Band cell ones. All right. And uh, ANA, uh, uh, ANCA, and anti-GBM antibody was also sent, and we have asked the interventional radiology team to uh, be concerned uh, to come and see the patient for a uh, bedside drainage, as uh, in, uh, we thought the patient will be is too unstable to take to the uh, OR for a operative intervention at that. Uh, but uh, Dr. Chandraji, sir, any comments on the hemoptysis? Like you have sent Anka and all this anti-GBM. No, I don't know why he had an hemoptysis, but he had uh, he had one. Um, actually, uh, if you look at the CT scan, obviously we could not give all the cuts of the CT scan. Uh, in certain cuts, it looked like as if this patient had a showering of. Uh, you know septic emboli like but maybe it was too early because classically septic emboli should have some central necrosis but something like that was not there um but in certain other cuts obviously it looks like ards um uh, i i don't know why he had hemoptysis obviously he also had a, a little bit of a deranged coagulation his uh, prothrombin time was raised Uh, and sometimes when people try to cough uh, uh, or maybe trying to vomit on top of an NIV, which is kind of an obstructive thing, they might do some retching, and that retching can produce some uh, little, little bit of hemoptysis. But that didn't recur after that. I agree. This was just a single episode, and uh, I think it's non-specific. You know, probably un unrelated to. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Then uh, the interventional radiology team uh, visited the patient and planned a PCN, uh, percutaneous nephrostomy, in the evening. Uh, during the percutaneous nephrostomy, they have drained 700 ml pus mixed fluid. Uh, after that, the uh, there is no further spike of fever, no hemo further hemoptysis. The noradrenaline dose came uh, tapering down, and the oxygen requirement of the patient also decreased. Right. Uh, so I just want to ask you. You see, uh, the patient really improved after this intervention. Yes. So, what is the real message from this? 
their real message is source control is equally important in this Not patient equally. who have it's a the most important it's the most, most important, important thing in the management yeah. of sepsis because if whatever else you do antibiotics fluids is that these are all supportive therapies the most important intervention is source control source and in a post surgical patient you tend to think source control much quicker than you do in a non surgical patient okay remember that because i have a patient who's undergone a whipple surgery or some surgery and coming to the uh, icu with fever and with uh, you know elevated white cell count i am thinking surgical infection and back to ot but in a patient who comes like this now with urosepsis and all we tend to do medical management uh you know of course this patient had a stent and there were more overt signs but i'm just saying that always think source control the first thing this patient should have got is a ct scan to pick that up not the of course the initial resuscitation but i'm saying the faster you identify the problem and the faster you drain it because this patient if you had not identified and done all this would have probably got intubated in some time would have probably gone high up on vasopressors maybe he would have deteriorated and would have got intubated so it's like the sepsis leading to multi organ failure that's happening here you know his kidneys his liver his uh, all systems his lungs are getting affected his hemodynamics are getting affected so all systems are getting affected because of this sepsis so that's the most important thing in this patient and i think that's the thing that's uh, you know really saved this guy so this is the picture on the next day patient was not having any fever he was uh, he came down to oxygen of 2 liter per minute nasal cannula we stopped the niv also the noradrenal also tapered down there was total 200 uh, 2100 ml of drainage fluid in the back uh, with a 1 uh, 100 150 ml of urine in last 24 hours we have repeated in chest x ray this is the chest x ray which is showing a um, considerable amount of improvement of the uh, shadow air pace uh, shadows or infiltrates that was present in the ct scan also right so he didn't was say it was like a mild kind of rds and probably all triggered by the sepsis and infection what about his liver function and all that did that improve and coming to my mind yeah, also the reports these are the uh, uh, further reports his total bilirubin came down to 6.1 with dilated bilirubin of uh, 8.8 with dilated bilirubin of 6.1 his liver enzymes were uh, uh, normal as uh, it was before his total count also came to uh, 13400 and his creatinine also came down to 4.5 his stored sodium improved to uh, 135 that is uh, it is two days uh, prior to that report when the first report was 122 two days after it is 135 And potassium is three point eight. And bicarb is also twenty two. Uh, the urine and blood culture that we have sent from the ER grew plebeial and pneumonia, and the pus we are sent there also grew plebeial, MDR plebeial and pneumonia. This is the sensitivity report of the plebeial and pneumonia, and it was intermediately sensitive to colistin and phospho. It was sensitive to phospholipids. Right. so you are on the right antibiotic like i said phosphomycin is a very good uh, drug for mdr kind of urinary tract infections right it almost covers 90% of these mdr bugs uh, i mean it's, it's a really good drug to use for uh, urinary tract infection but you are going to look up the class for me huh? don't forget that okay so now yes. yes, right. definitely i will look it up definitely okay and this is subsequent event of the patient pretty much uh, our problems were solved he was uh, off oxygen by day 5 hemodynamically stable his creatinine came down to as low as 1.6 his total bilirubin came down to 2.9 uh, with a urea of 39 and he was shifted to hdu on the day of 5 and on day 7 he was shifted to wards under the care of a nephrologist he is still following up with the nephrologist uh, they have uh, subsequent events they have uh, removed the dj stent which actually found to be a infant tube feeding tube inserted in the ureter we all uh, we all knew that it was a dj stent but it, uh, it came to a surprise to us also during the operation it uh, was a infant feeding tube and he is now quite well and is uh, actually awaiting for uh, further urological uh, management of his conditions so this is really a case of timely intervention okay maybe a little delayed because another hospital yes. in ER then to you in one or two days but really this patient would have deteriorated for sure you would have had to intubate him you would have gone up on vasopressors and it would have been that whole sepsis multi organ failure kind of story so we were just lucky that you know you could tide over with the non invasive ventilation while your interventions were on and you were able to uh, sometimes you are lucky they could do it at the bedside 
But a lot of these patients will need to be taken to the radiology. The thing in this condition, the wise thing to do is to electively intubate such a patient. Yeah, never take them on this uh, non-invasive support because they can crash during the procedure. Okay. So then, an elective intubation would have been warranted because you know sometimes they cannot do this kind of drainage and all. They were very probably very good uh, IR team that you have that was able to do it at the bedside uh, for you. But most of the time, they uh, want the uh, done under guidance. You know, image controlled and uh, the same, which is often the case. So uh, really the important lesson here is that source control, because you look at every system and all the labs and everything normalizes. So it was just uh, sepsis leading to multi-organ failure uh, triggered by this uh, renal infection. So this is our final diagnosis, septic shock multi-system organ failure in a patient with right-sided pyelonephritis and bilateral renal calculi. There's one thing, but you didn't do for the patient. One symptom he came with. You didn't do anything for that. Or at least I didn't see <laughs> What was that? We what have taken care stop? of his dyspnea. We have taken care of his flank pain. And pain, pain. What did you give him for pain? You didn't say anything about pain control. Oh. Okay. Nothing you gave uh, him for pain. I didn't see any analgesic. Okay, a patient coming like this is in severe pain. Yes, okay. I, I'm not so you must give him I'm some fentanyl. You have to give him pain relief. Okay. Yes, opioid analgesics we have given actually. Yes. Of course, you have to give him pain relief. Okay. But don't go on and on treating his pain because that will mask the, you know, what is underlying. So you need to do imaging and find out and do a drainage like you did. But the pain control, you have to treat his symptoms and resuscitate. That goes simultaneously, right? You can't keep him in pain endlessly while you're making a diagnosis. <laughs> I don't think you mentioned anything about pain relief, right? No, I haven't mentioned. I mean, he was, he was given opioid antibiotics, uh, opioid analgesics actually. That is also part of your uh, analysis. So in this setting, which opioid would you prefer? Morphine or fentanyl? Um, and why? Uh, what did you give him? Uh, actually, uh, in uh, uh, okay. ICU, we have given him tramadol. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we haven't given him fentanyl. Word. Yeah. Why not morphine? Morphine and patients with respiratory failure, morphine will be more depressant to the respiratory system. Is it because of the respiratory failure? In fact, some people will give morphine to a patient breathing like that, so tactic 40 to slow down his respiration a bit. Am I talking from that standpoint? Choice of opioid. No, ma'am, the what renal. Happened? What were his labs? His renal hepatic dysfunction, all that, right? Yes, yes. both renal and hepatic dysfunction was there. So, so, high. so yes. what is the difference? Some that will also. Mechanism. What happens? The yes. metabolite. Morphine has what kind of. Uh, See, your examiner can take you anywhere, right? If you talk about pain, then pain control, then which opioid, why? The metabolites? I'm saying between morphine and uh, fentanyl. <laughs> then why, uh, why not morphine? I'm saying, no, you're right. I would be fentanyl instead of, uh, you know, with tramadol, the pain may not settle. It's quite severe, right? So uh, yes. I would give, uh, not a synthetic opioid, I would give fentanyl to this patient. Hmm. But why not morphine is my question, right? Because of I have to see, ma'am. I really don't know at this moment. What are the active metabolites? You have to know that, okay? This is very, very important. This is critical care. This is not. Uh, this is very important, okay? Because you can't say that uh, when you discharge, you will give pain relief. You have to give pain relief there. Right? Hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you, Shubhaji. You have done very well, presented very nicely, and uh, answered very nicely. And uh, we thank ma'am for the wonderful uh, teaching imparted to him and to everybody, all the audience, mainly students. And uh, Chandrashree, sir, you would like to comment yeah. on it was your case? No, I think uh, it was a very uh, uh, interactive discussion and thanks, uh, Dr. Sheila, for it. Uh, there were a little bit of a, a jumble up thing which happened because... Um, uh, I didn't want to comment in between. The first ABG was actually when the patient was wheeled into the emergency, not on the NIV. Okay, okay. So at that time, that's why the patient was pretty hypoxic. He Usually in the ER, they come on this rebreathing mask. And, uh, 57 or 58 was a PO2, right? Yeah, yeah. So And as, and within, I think, by the time he reached ICU in a couple of hours, the PC, PO2 went up to 147. So mm -hmm. I definitely think there was a significant component of food overload. That's why they res he responded so well to the possibly, possibly. positive pressure. Yeah. yeah. It may be and as soon as the but also because the sepsis was worsening and you know getting he was going towards multi organ failure. May yes, not be exactly. a, like a frank ARDS, but that would have been the situation in a day or two. That that should not have reversed in one and a half days. I don't think that frank ARDS would have reversed. There was a significant amount of fluid overload. 
and um, that uh, as soon as one the urine started coming physician for a diuretic just uh, one shot of a diuretic you know Often yeah uh, maybe um, I, I we didn't give much of a diuretic because the patient was uh, hemodynamically unstable and um, actually uh, i think the most of the urine was started coming just after we did a pcm hmm. so the urine started pouring from the infected kidney and the left side kidney is already jammed with a big staghorn calculus correct correct so so i think this is the only kidney which was functioning and because it was hydronephrotic hmm. uh, there was hardly any urine the hydronephrotic i'm not very calculus. sure whether the stent yeah. the there were many things why this guy you know would have had uh, but this is a true life you know uh, real life case yeah. and so what happens many things don't happen according to the book oh, so no, that's no. why the i am only telling him no it was very well managed and what's important is the end result but i'm just telling no, no. Him, uh, Yeah, yeah. from an exam point of view you know i would uh, exactly. evaluate my dm students they should have a very you should have a flow to what you're saying it has to be a very uh, you know what is the history what is examination then the systematic way of going through it and also absolutely in though you know we may not do all the clinical examination i may not have done a yeah. clinical time check for a long time but that's the way you have to proceed with uh, answering the exam question yeah? yes absolutely agree with you Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Anyway, that was very well managed and was a very complicated case of multi organ failure. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, thanks again, Shubhajit. Once again, so request, ma'am, to do a presentation on hemodynamic resuscitation. Uh, do, you, do you want that? Because <laughs> yes, 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 not please. okay. I I can just uh, share that with you, but um, I mean, you can. It'll just be like ten, fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah. fine. That's yeah, fine. Can, uh, just comment a bit on because this case just didn't have hemodynamics, so. I just thought, are you okay, Tapesh, for me to do it? Look yeah, at your time. Yeah, please, fine, wonderful. Yeah, so I'll just tell you um, a little on the highlights of the uh, hemodynamic guidelines. Um, I have a bit of a conflict here because I am part of the SSC COVID guidelines that have just been published last year. I was very honored actually to be part of this, and now I'm on the Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, Research Committee. Uh, you know, preparing for the next research questions in these guidelines. So here you've all seen the surviving sepsis campaign, uh, the international guidelines for the management of sepsis and sepsis shock. I just like to tell all the exam-going students that if you don't know some minor details about things, you're fine. But if you don't know sepsis and ARDS when you are doing critical care, this is the bread and butter of critical care, and these are two things that you need to know really, really in and out and really, really well. So I would focus a lot on the management of sepsis and management of ARDS. Okay, so the current recommendations. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen it, but they have uh, different. You know, the, the this kind of sign for best practice. Uh, no recommendation, weak recommendation, strong recommendation, and also for against. So if it's green, it is for, and if it's against, it is uh, like this. And then they also judge it based on the evidence. So high quality, moderate, low quality, very low quality, and if something has. Changed, uh, they have either upgraded or downgraded the recommendations from the previous ones. They put this kind of sign, uh, no change at all, or some new recommendation. So this is the kind of uh, just introducing you to the key, so I can go through this very fast and tell you what the specific changes are. So talking about initial resuscitation, now sepsis and septic shock are, are medical emergencies, and they recommend the treatment and the resuscitation to begin. Uh, immediately okay that's that's best practice is obviously logical that if someone comes sick to you you're not going to wait for a while and for patients with sepsis induced hypoperfusion at least 30 ml of crystalloid should be given within the first 3 hours now this is a little controversial low quality of evidence and this is not a very strong recommendation the initial one said we recommend initial resuscitation from sepsis induced hypoperfusion at least 30 ml of crystalloids to be given in the uh, first three years so it's a little bit of down because earlier it was a stronger recommendation but now it's a weaker recommendation nevertheless this has been strongly criticized because what people say is that you can't give 30 ml to everybody why don't you give some amount look at the response and then decide whether you have to give this uh, further then with adults from se with sepsis or sepsis shock so again it suggests now whereas earlier it was a recommendation okay now uh, we suggest using dynamic measures to guide fluid resuscitation over physical examination or static parameters so instead of using cvp po pg dv etc you should use things like pulse pressure variation stroke volume variation plr etc dynamic parameters echocardiographic variables for adults with sepsis or septic shock we suggest guiding resuscitation to decrease the serum lactates in patients with elevated lactates or not using 
uh, over not using the serum lactates. And this is again low quality of evidence, but it's a reasonably good recommendation. And for adults with septic shock, we suggest using. So this is new. Okay. So what is uh, these are not changed. Whereas what you see in blue for adults with septic shock, we suggest using. So capillary useful time has been reached after the underwent a shock study. Uh, they have recommended to guide resuscitation or as an adjunct. So a uh, very strong recommendation. So you should talk about a uh, couple of weeks time. So then coming to the rationale for 30 ml of crystalloids. So there was this retrospective study for adults presenting to the emergency department with sepsis or septic shock. And here they found a uh, failure to receive 30 ml of crystalloid fluid within three hours of sepsis onset was associated with increased odds of in-hospital mortality, delayed resolution of hypotension, and increased length of stay. So it was a very small study based on which they've continued this recommendation, but they've given a weaker recommendation. But this has one of the most criticized uh, uh, you know, aspects of the surviving sepsis guidelines. Uh, so a, a, a better way of doing it, rather than just give very fast 30 ml over th uh, to this patient, what you could do is you could give maybe 10 ml per kg, give one pint, Look at a response, maybe a quick echocardiographic assessment, and then you could continue giving the remaining 20 ml, if not uh, contraindicated. Then for adults with septic shock, we suggest using capillary refill time uh, to guide fluid resuscitation as an adjusted, adjusted to perfusion. So again, this is again based on the study that you just alluded to, the Andromeda uh, shock study. So this is the recommendation is based on that. Then capillary refill time, I won't go into details of the Andromeda study, you know the study. Uh, what was the result? The capillary refill time had significantly less organ failure in those patients who were um, in which this was used. Though overall there was no mortality difference, that was a primary endpoint. So, despite the absence of a clear effect on mortality, using the capillary refill time during resuscitation has physiological plausibility. And the other very good thing is it's very cheap, it's very easy to perform, it's non invasive and no cost. So, definitely clinically at the bedside, this is something that you can uh, use at the uh, bedside. And this is from the Adnobita Shock study that was published in uh, JAMA. Now, what about fluid management? So, no difference from recommending crystalloids as first line. The new change is that for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest using balanced crystalloids instead of normal saline. Okay, so this is the first time that they have, uh, you know, changed. this is again based on low quality of evidence, but we have the basic study now. So we suggest using either balanced crystalloids or saline for fluid resuscitation of patients with septic sepsis or septic shock. So this was the 2016 statement, and now they have said use balanced crystalloid instead of normal saline. So even your ringer lactate, we would consider as a balanced crystalloid. Then uh, the other two statements on use of albumin and use of starches that you use, uh, you know, the against using starches remain the same. Okay, but, uh, you know, high against, you can see two red at these things. But what is new here is for adults with sepsis and septic shock, we suggest against using gelatin for resuscitation. So uh, earlier it was just, the, uh, uh, you know, this recommendation against starches for resuscitation. But here they've talked specifically about gelatins. And earlier, the recommendation was we suggest using crystalloids over uh, gelatins and resuscitating. Now it's against gelatins for resuscitating. So clearly, crystalloids and that too, a recommendation for balanced crystalloids or saline for fluid resuscitation. Now, vasoactive drugs is interesting. For adults with septic shock, we recommend. So norepinephrine, that remains the same as a first line of uh, treatment. They've given the evidence with the other agents. But definitely in septic shock, vaso vasoactive drugs are preferred. And uh, then the other uh, recommendations pretty much remain the same, that you uh, use add, uh, consider adding vasopressin instead of escalating doses of norepinephrine. And we suggest adding epinephrine in cases where norepinephrine, there's no good, and uh, vasopressin, there isn't a good response. Or for adults with septic shock, we suggest, uh, this was also previously there, against the use of terlipressin. And uh, also for adults with septic shock and cardiac dysfunction, you would uh, consider using dobutamine. So these were already there previously. What is new is for adults with septic shock and cardiac dysfunction with persistent hyperperfusion despite adequate volume status and arterial blood pressure, we suggest against the use of levosimendin. So there is a strong recommendation, uh, low quality of evidence, but against the use of levosimendin, which was not there earlier in the surviving sepsis uh, guideline. And uh, the data for this is a meta-analysis of three R randomized control trials have shown that levosimendin compared to no inotric agents did not impact on mortality. I won't go into details of the data from the leopard study that showed that, uh, again, levosimendin versus no inotropic agent was associated with lower likelihood 
of successful bleeding from the ventilator. And then again, another meta-analysis of seven RCTs comparing levosimendin with dobutamine showed that levosimendin was not superior. So there's a lot of evolving uh, evidence. And for the first time, they gave a statement against the use of levosimendin. Now, uh, coming to hemodynamic recommendations, uh, of course, you need to use arterial blood pressure over non-invasive as soon as you know, a patient in shock. So initial resuscitation, you can continue uh, without an arterial line, but you should put in an arterial line at the earliest. Now, what is new is here they've added for adults with septic shock, we suggest starting vasopressors peripherally to restore the mean artery. So don't wait till you put in an arterial line, uh, you know, a central line. You can start from a peripheral line initially rather than delay the initiation until the central line is uh, secured. So this was a new recommendation. And also they've said there's insufficient evidence to make a recommendation for the use of restrictive versus liberal fluid strategies in the first 24 hours of uh, resuscitation. So they've, um, you know, this is new. They've actually made a statement that they are not going for liberal or restrictive, uh, you know, a fluid uh, strategy. Vasopressors through the peripheral line, as uh, I've told you, a lot of people delay giving vasopressors. They are very afraid to give it through the peripheral line. And as a result, the patients uh, get hemodynamic resuscitation late. So don't wait for this. And, uh, you know, and sometimes specialized equipment and training may not be available. And large randomized controlled trials that compare central and peripheral catheter for infusion of vasopressors are actually lacking. So not very strong evidence, but of course, we don't want to give vasopressors through the uh, peripheral. And this is just a cartoon showing you the initial, uh, you know, recommendations for using the vasoactive uh, medication. So you use norepinephrine as your first line of uh, vasopressors. Initial target. Remember, your target is not 65. The initial target is 65. And consider invasive monitoring with arterial blood pressure. If central line is not yet available, then consider giving it from a peripheral line. If MAP is inadequate, despite low to moderate doses of norepinephrine, then you consider adding vasopressin. And if cardiac dysfunction with persistent hypoperfusion is present, then only should you uh, start dobutamine. You shouldn't just start dobutamine to improve the uh, perfusion in this patient. There should be cardiac dysfunction. So the recommendations are pretty uh, straightforward with the vasoactive uh, medications. Now, uh, going through the initial resuscitation, just one or two slides. The patient said, okay, or should I stop? Please, please. Uh, so uh, if you go by the recommendations for initial rec resuscitation, Sepsis and septic shock are medical emergencies, and we recommend that treat, treatment and resuscitation begin immediately. And this is exactly what uh, Dr. Sen was talking about, right? He was treating the patient, and at the same time, also, the resuscitation had begun. Again, they suggest, it is not recommended anymore, 30 ml of IV crystalloid within the first three hours of uh, resuscitation. Weak recommendation, low quality of evidence, but it's still there. And using dynamic measures to guide fluid resuscitation over physical examination and static parameters. So initially, it's okay to use your physical examination and parameters, but subsequently, especially in this kind of patient where you have, uh, you know, um, overt signs of fluid overload and things like that. So managing this kind of shock can be complicated. You should consider uh, some dynamic measure for fluid responsiveness before giving more fluid. And then they've said for adults in septic shock, we suggest guiding resuscitation to decrease the lactate in patients with elevated lactate. And capillary refill time, first time is introduced, and we suggest using capillary refill time to guide the resuscitation as an uh, adjunct. In terms of fluid management, I'm just summarizing all the things that I spoke about. You use crystalloids as first line, balanced crystalloids instead of normal saline for resuscitation, Use albumin in patients, who, especially those who receive very large volume of crystalloids, over using crystalloids alone. So if you think they have really leaky capillaries and they're not and still remaining hypotensive, you're giving fluid, BP comes up, again, BP goes down, you're giving more fluid. These are the patients you could consider using albumin. And we recommend against the use of starches. And we suggest against the use of gelatin. So strong recommendation for gelatin has come now. Vasoactive drugs, as was earlier, recommend using norepinephrine as a first line. Add vasopressin instead of escalating the doses. So when you see your doses of norepinephrine are going up, 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 that's the time to start vasopressin, not when you are at the maximum dose of norepinephrine. And inadequate MAP uh, levels, despite norepinephrine and vasopressin, in this kind of situation, you can consider adding adrenaline. And then def this time, there's a strong uh, recommendation against the use of uh, terlipressin. Regarding inotropes, if there's cardiac dysfunction with persistent hypoperfusion uh, and adequate, uh, despite the adequate volume status, then you can consider using dobutamine. I know a lot of people start dobutamine just like that when the lactates are high, peripheries are 
cold and there's uh, you know inadequate tissue perfusion uh, but you must consider adding dobutamine only in this kind of uh, setting and dobutamine should be preferred over norepinephrine or using epinephrine alone. And for adults with septic shock and cardiac dysfunction with persistent hypotension, despite adequate fluid uh, status and arterial blood gas, we suggest against the use of levosimendin. I don't know how many people are using it, but a lot of people were using levosimendin in the ICU. Again, a word of caution, this has a very long half-life, okay? So this is really not a drug for, despite the beneficial effects, it's really not the drug for an intensive care unit. And monitoring and IV access, the first time they have said that invasive monitoring of arterial blood pressure over non-invasive as uh, you know, a practical and if resources are available. Of course, in some resource limited settings, it may not be available, but you should use any patient in shock, you should put in an arterial line at the earliest. And we also they also suggested that vasopressors from a peripheral line should be started and don't wait till the central line is put, though you must give the uh, vasopressors finally through the central line. And fluid balance, there is insufficient evidence to make a recommendation on restrictive versus liberal. So these are all the recommendations that have been made for uh, the fluid, for the hemodynamic management uh, aspects of uh, the surviving sepsis guideline, the surviving sepsis. Now the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines itself has been criticized. And we believe that it's time to individualize a lot of the therapies. You know, these kind of guidelines are very good across the board when you're dealing with a large majority of people. You're in the at home in the middle of the night. You have to have some resident taking care of the patient. It's good to have this kind of guidance. But we believe that you should individualize. And uh, soon after these guidelines were published, uh, along with um, many other stalwarts, we wrote these uh, um, you know, this article in critical care, equilibrating surviving sepsis guidelines with individualized care. And I was really, really honored to be a part of this uh, elite group who wrote this. And what we did is we took each part of the surviving sepsis guidelines and we, uh, you know, looked at the recommendation that was made and we made 20 suggestions as to how we could uh, do it how you could individualize your therapy rather than have a one size fits all. I can't read out all the recommendations, but for instance, you know, saying 30 ml of crystalloids for all patients within three hours. Rather than that, you can say that you give some fluid, assess the response, and then you give more fluid, right? Some patient might be 50 ml also, but assess the response and then individualizing PEEP, individualizing, um, you know, various aspects of, um, uh, you know, even the dynamic challenges, even um, uh, recommendations about um, optimizing the oxygen delivery. So a lot of parts of this we felt were not covered in the surviving sepsis guidelines, and we should have an approach a general approach and also how you could individualize because then if you just have a very broad based uh, level of recommendations then they not may not be i mean you can argue both ways but may not be uh, may not be optimal so perhaps we should move towards a guideline which is going towards more individualization so you give some caveats and you say okay do this but if this doesn't happen you should do this rather than just have a blanket one size uh, fits all Okay, so these were just the recommendations. And uh, I'll just end by saying that Sackett said evidence-based medicine is not a cookbook medicine. External clinical evidence can inform, but never replace individual clinical expertise. And it is this expertise that decides whether the external evidence applies to the individual patient at all. And if so, how it should be integrated. So this is very important. You can't have uh, this kind of, um, you know, one size fits all kind of advice. And it has to apply to that individual patient. And of course, there can be individual variations. And that's why we're clinicians. So sepsis is clearly one instance where the one size fits all approach probably does not work. And it may be time to move away from this mass approach based on pragmatic studies performed on heterogeneous population to more tailored studies which allow dissection and integration of the information that is uh, collected. So that's just a summary of the hemodynamic uh, recommendation. I'll stop my share here. Uh, thank you very much. I just thought I'd just go through that while, you know, uh, since we didn't cover hemodynamics in this case of uh, sepsis. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for covering the hemodynamic uh, of resuscitation for sepsis and showing the new guidelines and especially elaborating that one size does not fit all. That's very important. We have to individualize uh, decision making at the bedside. So thank you very much uh, for the teaching, the wonderful teaching for all of these students. And of course, uh, it'll be up on the YouTube channel and the students can go through it. Ma'am had taken a session earlier also on sedation and analgesia. For those of you who may not know, it's up on our YouTube channel. You can uh, review it. And uh, I thank Tindrishi, sir, for making this presentation possible. It has been a wonderful interactive teaching session. And uh, Subhaji, thanks a lot, uh, buddy. That was well done. Huh? You presented very nicely. All the best for your exams.
thank you thank you sir all the best thank you thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you audience thank you very nicely thank you 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 th